Good afternoon and welcome to the final concurrent session of the day, Building Connections Remotely. Our presenter today is Eileen Benz, faculty member at Monroe Community College. If you have any questions for the presenter during the session, please feel free to enter those into the Q&A section in your Zoom room screen, and we will address that at the end of the talk. On that note, I will hand it over to our presenter. Thank you very much, Victoria. I hope everybody's doing well. It's super exciting when you can be part of this. So I appreciate you taking your time to be here because I know you probably have a lot of things to do. Today, right before this session, I had a knock on my door. And when I opened the door, it was one of my students from a night class of mine. It was a public speaking class. And he told me that he came to my office because he didn't know who else to chat with about something that had recently happened that set him back a little bit in his classes. He also happens to be on a sports team and it's affecting his play. And I think about how we're about mid-semester now and I felt so accomplished in that moment because when a student doesn't know where to turn and they decide to turn to you, you know that you've made a difference. And it's not about doing huge things. It's not about allowing them not to complete an assignment or truly going out of your way. I believe it's really about doing little things along the way that make them feel like they can turn to you. So these are the things that I'm going to share with you today that I believe you could put into practice either tonight in a class or even tomorrow. Little things that build connections and especially building connections remotely. These things are things that help us feel valued, connected, and they, they make us feel safe. And that's especially true when we learn remotely because you may be familiar with how it feels to be isolated. Right now, I'd love to see your faces. It feels isolating. And we don't want our students to feel that way. Whether you have been teaching online only since COVID, I know you never want to hear that word. I never really want to say that again. Or whether you've been teaching five years, 10 years, 20 years, there's always something that we can learn about the online experience. Luckily for me, I believe I had been teaching online for about 20 years. And when COVID hit, the only thought that went through my mind was, how am I going to transition my face-to-face -face public speaking class online, especially when some students have technical problems? But it's even today, 20 years later, where I'm learning these little things that really do make a big difference. So whether you've been teaching 20 years like me or more, or whether you've just started teaching online, I really believe that we can do things that extend through the technology and make us feel like we're with our students and that they're with them and with us and they're not alone. I believe it is really the relationship that yields success. And when I think of relationships, I know that there's been someone in my world growing up who made me feel like I could accomplish anything. And typically for most people, it's a teacher or it's someone in a teaching setting, a mentor, so to speak. And it doesn't matter what you teach. You could teach math, you can teach science, you can teach philosophy. You can be that one person that really makes a difference for that student. And it is because of the relationship they feel they have with you. These tiny nurturing moments are what can help them feel successful. That's what we're going to talk about. And I know we're, we're so busy. We have so many things on our plate that we just don't want to do one more. Sometimes I feel like whenever we are told we have to do one more thing, we have to do things differently and learn the new process. It feels a little like this. That's my daughter. No daughters were harmed in the making of that video. 
<laughs> I told her I would be tossing a ball and it wouldn't hurt her. Have you ever felt like that? Like you're throwing things out and nobody's grasping or you just don't want to turn around and catch. I know, I know, I feel that way too sometimes. One of the mantras that my husband and I have always shared with our daughter is that effort takes zero skill. And that means that you don't have to be good at something to try. Our effort is a choice we make. And as professors, it is true that we are leading the way. Notice I say leading the way. I don't believe that I should be working harder than my students. I do believe that I can only lead them. And of course, they need to take the reins and progress through the coursework. With a little bit of time, almost no time for some of these things, and a little bit of effort, we can not only help our students be successful, but we can feel successful in our role. And it really is about three different steps. I wanna talk about feeling connected, helping students feel connected, helping them stay connected, and helping them feel valued. And in so doing, we're really going to be talking about being present, that social presence, because we all need relationships. We all have friends, we have colleagues, people we, we rely on. It's that social connection that really helps us retain our students. I'm also going to talk about staying connected to the course. It's that teaching presence that allows not just our course really, but even what's happening in our institutions stay top of mind for our students. Because especially at a community college where some people are coming to campus and then leaving, we want them to take advantage of the opportunities on campus. And sometimes they don't take enough time to be aware of all that is offered. So a teaching presence allows them to stay connected. And then, of course, how are we going to be that one teacher that makes our students feel valued? That's the cognitive presence. It is a way to think about the self-esteem of our students and who couldn't use a boost, right? But to, to allow them to say to themselves, I need someone who makes me feel like I care or I'm cared for. And in return, I wanna care about them. So how can we do that for our students? So let's start by looking at that social presence. Today, I happen to be in my office on campus and you'd notice that I don't have a blank wall. I allow people to see inside my office because we're all curious people. That curiosity allows us to be connected. And therefore, you can see my background. This is what my office looks like, nothing fancy, though I do have a window, which is always nice. And it's not snowing, but it could be sunnier. That would be nice. <laughs> One thing I do do, though, is I want to make my students feel like this connection is important and their relationship is important. So I do come dressed for class. I don't wear a hoodie, you know, and some people do. Sometimes for meetings, I will dress a little less professionally, but I, I want my students to know that this is important to me. So I do always dress for class. And I do, in my online classes, give them a virtual tour of my house because a lot of times I'm working from my house. And this would be the video that they see online. Welcome to the Ben's house. Here is the office where it all takes place in case you are curious. Here is the desk where I live during the semester and we have our Zoom meetings. Up on the wall is a picture of my son playing baseball in Cooperstown when he was in, I guess, middle school. This is our daughter pitching, playing softball. On the wall behind me during most of our classes is a picture of the family, though you usually only see about that much of it on the bottom, from the bottom. <laughs> 
This is where the magic happens. And I look forward to a great semester with you. When I first begin class, this is both in Zoom classes where I'm teaching remotely, but also in my online class, I use a lot of family examples, real life examples. And I believe it starts with, who are you? So this gives them a little glimpse into who I am, who my children are, and the kinds of things that we like to do. And I would encourage you, you don't have to be too revealing, be as revealing as you feel comfortable, but I would encourage you to share what you can. A lot of times we see professors or students see professors as someone who's earned their master's and then their doctorate and they do research and we can be intimidating to our students. And that might not make them feel connected to us. Sometimes they don't feel not just comfortable, but they feel like they're nobody. So I want them to know that even though I may have lived longer and done more things, I'm still a person. So how can I encourage my students to come talk to me? Well, first I can personalize. Here's who I am. Here's what this room where I live for most of my life looks like. And I'm gonna share some personal stories with you. In, in my classes, I often have a couple of minutes chat or I will have a opening line that tells my, my students what's going on for the day. When I share these instances, of course, I do relate them to class. Today in my interpersonal course, I was talking about language and I shared the story about how my family has a family chat. Now, both of my children are in college, so we don't see them a lot. And about once a day, we share something. And my daughter, who is a forensic science student, my husband and I are smart, but I feel like she is brilliant. She sends in her chat that she got 100 in both her organic chemistry and her bio classes. And she is shocked and amazed. And my, my husband said, oh, that's good, because at some point, you know, you'll be able to help us out of a bind. And then my daughter says, oh, and by the way, I now have a criminal justice minor and it's not gonna cost me any more time or money or you any more money, she says. And then of course my husband chimes in saying, oh, that's good, now you can help our son if he ever gets into trouble. And then our son files back, hey, why am I getting thrown under the bus? Like just little things and, it was all about how sharing is really important. And then we talked about the language that was used in some of those messages that went back and forth. The opening chat is a place where you can ease in to the content of the course while setting up a story, making your students feel a little bit more connected to you so that each class or each module they work through online we're peeling back an onion and we're showing them, hey, I'm, I'm just like you, I'm a person and I live and learn. This allows us to empathize with them because probably you get knocks on the door or you'll get an email from a student who's going through a hard time. And when I share even my hard times, that allows the students to understand. In fact, this week, I don't know how it happens. Sometimes it happens to you. This week, I have assignments in all of my classes due, which means I have well over 100 papers to respond to. <laughs> and when I told my students that, they said, yeah, it's like when I have tests for three subjects in the same week, or yeah, I have two papers due today. So there's a little bit of empathy there. You know, they see us as the one who gives work. I also like to tell them that I'm the one who has work to do. And of course, that helps them understand deadlines and going through the rest of the semester, we can empathize a little bit. Doesn't mean I change deadlines. It means that I'll be more efficient in the time that I have because we all have 24 hours. 
What is helpful, especially in remote classes, is using the breakout rooms, using the whiteboard, the polls, the reactions, because while we can't communicate even now face to face, there are questions in the Q&A that you could pose. And these little things don't really take a lot of time, but they tell someone that we're connected. So I can see you. I, I do want you to share and we can perform for one another. So the first step is that social presence. It helps with retention. It helps develop relationships, which can encourage students to not only see you in a crisis, but to feel like they want to perform in class, they want to do better, they'll come to you for extra help. The next step to doing some little things for our students to help us feel connected is that teaching presence. It is tough to have that interaction, especially before class when you're getting set up. But if there's a deadline coming up, we want more interaction as students need help. So I'll always send an email. I might reach out to someone specifically who I think might have more trouble with a particular assignment. After a class or after a module is closed that's online, I might send a message to remind students or maybe reinforce something that I think might have been problematic based on some of the work that I'm seeing come in. I very often send course announcements at least once a week. I try not to do more than two or three. But the beauty of a course announcement with the technology that we have is I can pre-plan them. This way, if I know that I want to send an announcement on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I can take five or 10 minutes, create my announcements online, set a date, and I don't have to be there to send the announcement immediately. So that's a really helpful tool in an online class. Often as well, which is almost part of the social presence is probably like you, I might get a question from a student after a lecture or after a module, or I might get a comment in a discussion that I will create as a course announcement so that I'll share a follow-up saying, I just got a great question, or did you see this question in the discussion post? Thanks, Tanya, for posting this. Here's a related video, and I'll send them a link that will maybe reinforce one of those ideas that was part of the course concepts. So those follow-ups do a couple of things. They reinforce the concept, and they tell everyone that Tanya did such a great Thing by asking a question or reinforcing an idea, because now it'll help us all. Sometimes there are extra discussion posts. For example, one of the other classes I teach is a public relations course, and I love the spring semester because we have the Super Bowl. So I will take advantage of just-in-time life experiences, and I'll create a new discussion. Maybe I'll throw five or 10 extra points in it and I'll say, here's something that's happening in the world today. Here's a short response you might want to talk about. And for that couple of minutes, we can have a great discussion and you can earn a little bit extra points too. So it helps students realize that, first of all, what we're doing is applicable in the real world because they're always questioning that. And it enhances the discussion. When we do that, we can see a different side of things. And it's great when it's something fun for students. As you can imagine, all of the people who liked sports, especially football, participated. And those who just like to watch the commercials participated as well. So if you can ever find those extras, it's another way to keep them connected in the course. Email I use specifically to reach out to students. Sometimes I'll know something because of the relationship I've developed and I see an opportunity and I know my students so well, I know who this could best fit. For example, I know a couple of my students who have their own blogs. I know a couple of my students who have their own podcasts 
And if I see that another podcast host is looking for a panel to discuss something that was just shared on one of my students' blogs, I can connect them. When I email and reach out to students, they realize that they do have something that is worthy and they feel like what they're doing is generating some, not monetary gain, but some sort of gain that their worth matters. And the fact that I remembered what they did really strengthens our relationship. Also, if I see something where a student's struggling, I will certainly reach out to them and maybe share something or ask them if they want to meet with me. I noticed on this last quiz, these category of questions, they didn't turn out so well. And I know that you have the answers, but I didn't know if the answers made sense to you. So is there anything in that we can maybe chat about for five, 10 minutes and help you understand the concepts better? One of the things I do regularly is I send college information, whether it is something from our counseling office, something from the health office, I will often send a message similar to the one here that says, just so you know, there's this Seeds of Success program where their talk, the college is offering free workshops about how to study for tests. Remember, it is flu season. Here are the flu shot clinics available. This not only reminds them, hey, I'm looking out for you, but don't forget that projects do subconsciously. Don't forget me, I'm not forgetting you. And oftentimes students don't always pay attention to what's offered on a larger scale. They're looking at their work, they're looking at their life and they miss a lot of opportunities. So I take those opportunities whenever I can to say, here's some college info that you may have missed. So making relationships helps me stay connected with my students. It allows us to build not only off of the content of the course, but the information that the college offers. And then I think there's that one huge piece where we definitely want our students to feel valued. And this is that cognitive presence. Of course, I talk about the expectations for grading in the course, and I, I give them a sheet that describes my perception of grades, right? A is above and beyond. And if you know, you're doing everything that you need to do, and these are things that happen, here's how that might affect your grade. It, it could happen to anybody. I don't want you to feel like you can't earn a grade based on these things. But just like anything, if we understand expectations, then we can go back and talk to those expectations. And we realize, oh, it's not a personal thing. These were the expectations that were set out in the class. Just like our syllabus is our contract and they understand, you know, I, yeah, I'm your professor and we're developing this relationship and here are the course concepts. Sometimes things happen that are outside of your maybe control, if you want to say, yet these are my expectations. And if you talk to my students, they will say, I have very high expectations. What I love about that and what I love about sharing them is that students then feel like when they accomplish goals and do well, they really surprise themselves. And that demonstrates that boost of self-esteem. Wow, this was really hard. You said I could do it. And these were the expectations you set for how I should do it. And I did it. One example of that is public speaking their speeches. I tell them from speech to speech that the expectations are going to become higher because with every speech you're developing skills. In meeting those expectations, here's when you should be finished editing. Here's when I expect that you should finish practicing. Here's when you should finish rehearsing. And that's how you meet those expectations. So it's setting the expectations as well as giving them tools to meet them. It is very easy to use a rubric. I do use rubrics. 
But in addition, I make sure that I personalize that feedback because a rubric only says so much. And I know personalized feedback can be time consuming, but you don't have to write a lot. And sometimes I find if I write too much, it's overwhelming and they don't look at all of it. I make sure that to write notes specific for them and really write more about something that is a big hitter that can help them the most. In addition, I write down what they're doing well. And I really write a lot about what they're doing well because sometimes we're only getting feedback about what should be changed. And I want them to know that in and of the work that they're doing now, they're doing okay. Because just quelling their, their worries, especially the overachiever, someone who is really worried, has all that self-talk, doubt, I want them to recognize that you're on the right path. It's okay. One day at a time, you're doing okay. I always respond to emails within the day, often during the day, along the day, but I never wait more than a weekend. I do my best to have a life. <laughs> I know that's hard. If there's a speech coming up and it's a Monday and I know they're really worried, I might respond on a Sunday. But otherwise, I am very timely about email and responding. And this way, they know that if I don't respond, it means I didn't get your email. So that's helpful for them. A lot of the time, I will ask students for examples. So if their work is good, I'll ask them for permission to use their work as a feature example. And just like in this email example here, students will be excited. Thank you for the feedback. Yeah, you can use this as a future example. And that really boosts their self-esteem. If, if they're made a good example for others, that says a lot. Office hours are not just for problems. I always tell them if you want to hide out for a minute, you want to come and get some candy from the bowl, just, just come and visit me. You don't have to always make an appointment. Really explain what office hours are and maybe open them to just a chat session or event session. And they come in somewhat frequently, which is why I have a note on my door. I hope nobody knocks. <laughs> and like I said before, I share stories about my life, about my family about work, about my time in school. And I tell people about my mistakes, right? We're not perfect. When, especially when students find, oh, you forgot to open this quiz or I can't find the homework in the module. Oh, and I forgot to open it. <laughs> I'll fess up, not perfect. Yep, write it on the calendar. I'll tell my husband to put it on the calendar. Yeah, today she wasn't perfect. You know, we all make mistakes. So let's own it and move on. Own it and move on. I say that a lot. So these are really the little things that help us feel connected, stay connected, and feel valued as a student. Uh, other things that you might even do is maybe you're nudging people. Right? I walk around in class. It's obviously easier to say, hey, don't forget to submit this. but through an email, through a course announcement, maybe I'll send a reminder. Hey, it's preview time for the next module. It's open now. Don't forget to do that. I might invite them to come with me to an event. Hey, I'm going to this event. Sometimes students don't like to go by themselves. So I might invite them in that way. As far as courses, I always do my best like you probably do, to offer real experiences. I think it's the consistency that we provide that will help them feel connected. And sometimes I do give them options. Hey, you can either write an essay, create a presentation, maybe you're gonna draw or be artistic in this next assignment, that's yours to hear the criteria. Because I think what you can do is of value and it might not be that I need an essay right? People might be more excited about the coursework and feel connected, feel like I'm connected to them and I want to know more about them. And I always tell people, I am your biggest cheerleader. I will say hello to you. 
wherever we are. In fact, there have been times when I'm walking through a grocery store and my daughter at the time would say, hey, mom, that that person's looking at you. Do they look like one of your students? <laughs> because they don't know I have a life outside of the classroom or outside of the college or outside of that remote class, the online class where they only see my comments. So I put in a lot of videos. I put in a lot of even still pictures. And whenever I see them out in the community because of the pictures, they come up to me. I was just out watching a band Friday night and one of my students said, I think you're my professor. <laughs> Those are the things I value most because that meant not only are they looking at the material in the modules, but they felt connected, not just to the course, but in a relationship with me that they felt comfortable to come to me. And, you know, maybe you can be that one person through their college experience that they said, yeah, that, that was the person who I felt most connected to. That was the person, even if it wasn't directly, that I felt like I could succeed in this class, in this program, at this school. It, it really is the little things. I don't know if you have read Make Your Bed. You probably have. Here's, you know, there are some links here. But, you know, it's really just like making your bed in the morning. What little thing that doesn't take a lot of time can matter the most? There are also some other examples. If you know the author James Lang, he's written Small Teaching and Small Teaching Online, which gives you tips and tricks. And these are really great references. So what are you going to do? Right? Effort takes zero skill. Beyond the skills you all have, because you're all successful in what you do, what can you do to create that social presence and make students feel connected to you personally? What can you do to create a teaching presence and have students connected to the course, to the college? And how can you create that cognitive presence to make your students feel valued? In turn, of course, it makes you feel valued. because. Right? Most of us, I would say, don't do it for the money. <laughs> right? We do it because we love it. I do it because I love my students. I love the relationships. I keep in touch with students for years and years. In fact, one of my students now does my hair. Another one takes care of my automobile. Right? These are people who will take care of us. So I want to make those relationships part of who I am and what they do in the classroom online. So what is one little thing that you can do? Think about a story. Think about an experience that you could use tomorrow. Doesn't really take a lot of time. And that is my presentation. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them for you. Thank you, Ms. Benz. That was wonderful. And thank you so much just for taking us along the, in the journey with you and showing us the videos that you <laughs> share with your students. Um, I do see that we have one question and my colleague has a few questions as well. Um, so the first one that we have is, um, many teach low income students almost exclusively. Um, quite a few of my students live in public housing, et cetera. Any concerns about demonstrating a lifestyle far beyond what they can afford? Right. That's a really great question because a lot of our students are like that too. And sometimes that's why they take online classes, right? Because then nobody will have to see them, know them, understand their circumstances. And I, I will. I share with them the fact that I'm only 22, <laughs> but I might be more than 22. And I didn't start here. I grew up in New York City, outside of New York City, and in college, just after college, starting out, I lived in a trailer with two other people. And it doesn't matter from where you come because, you know, some of the greatest success stories come from nothing. And the reason I share it is because we are all curious. That's all. 
we're all curious. And I'll share when, okay, so I have to go grocery shopping and I don't have time or I really wanted to buy this in the grocery store, but the budget just doesn't allow it. Or today my husband had a flat tire and now we had to figure out how to get to work. True, true story. So I always want them to know that, yeah, sometimes I get this is not where I come from. But when I share those stories, because I, like I said, I share stories, they realize, oh, okay. And you know, we can only feel what we feel. But throughout the semester, they realize that I don't care who you are, where you came from, because I'm going to be right there with you every step through this class and even beyond if you'd like me to, if you let me. That's awesome. I love that you're able to build those relationships in that way. Um, now, our attendees cannot see the chat um, here. So um, my colleague Lauren had a few questions that she's put in the chat here. Um, she was wondering, have you ever had any regret with being so authentic with your students? I, I can't say that I've regretted anything. You sometimes they'll tease me about things I say. <laughs> they tease me. There, in my interpersonal course, even I would share when there's there are four of us, four best friends, myself and my three girlfriends, and there's always someone to go to. Someone is going to tell you like it is. Someone is just going to listen and be that shoulder. Someone is going to solve it. And someone is going to explain how it could be worse. And in the four of us, I will often say, one of us is the end of the world kind of thing where I'll get a phone call and she'll say, oh my gosh, you, you'll never know what happened today. It was the worst day. And then the next day, the next week, oh, today is such a terrible day. She's Debbie Downer, we call her, right? So one of my students said, why is she your friend? <laughs> it's a good question but because she has a heart of gold you know we just know things about people and I find that the more I share it's not that I regret I, I don't want to come off being that person who knows it all or has this house or you know I try to say I might have the same exact experiences as you but life is still like this, no matter who you are. That's right. That's you know, and if I'm real, let that be the worst thing that they, they get. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um, there are a few more questions that my colleague Lauren had. Um, you spoke about staying connected and um, increasing your teaching presence. Do you have specific platforms or technologies um, that you found are really helpful for that? Well, of course, we are now on Brightspace, whether it's Blackboard or Brightspace, there, there are always the course announcements or sometimes just their email or a direct chat. But depending on the course and the students, you know, a, a direct email or sometimes we'll use Discord because a lot of students are on Discord. A lot of students still are on Instagram and it depends. In my public relations course, they use social media which of course can be isolating in it of itself and used incorrectly. But sometimes if there have been instances where if you don't have access, maybe your system went down or your computer's gone and you only have social media, here's, here's how you can find me. I know you have social media. <laughs> yes. So you can find me. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and what is, what is Discord? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that. Discord is... You mainly use for gaming. A lot of gamers use Discord okay. and it's not widely used. My son is a gamer, so that's how I know it mainly. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. Mm -hmm. um, here is another question. We are all making more and more remote connections lately. Do you have one piece of advice, no matter if it's in academia or outside of it, that can globally help us all? And would you share it with us? I ask questions. Here, here's a disclosure. I recently got into hockey. 
I was never a hockey fan. I'm a huge baseball fan. I was never a hockey fan. And I got into hockey because forever friends kept asking me who my hockey team was. Now, growing up in New York, I'm a Yankees fan. I hope, you know, I know there's probably Red Sox fans out there and all kinds of stuff. But growing up in New York, my family was never into hockey. And I I didn't like the the banter between the Islanders and Rangers. I I it I just didn't want anything to do with it. So I wrote off hockey. So I was out with friends one day and they were talking hockey and they said, you need to find a hockey team because it was an opposite sport to baseball. Long story short, I found a team. It's a Vegas Golden Knights. And I started liking hockey when they became the, an inaugural team. I knew nothing about hockey. So I went online, I joined these groups and I started talking to people. I started learning, asking some questions because I had to be careful because sometimes they don't like newbies, right? So how you ask questions, I would watch games and watch the chat in the game and on occasion. Long story short, I have 20 friends that I'm going to see spring break in Vegas. We're going to a hockey game together. I've, I've known them for five years now. And you think that it is a dangerous place online, which it is, but it is also such a great way to learn about things and develop relationships. I mean, people are getting married based on what they have learned, people they've met. So yes, be cautious, but be willing. Be willing and definitely, yes, take it all with a grain of salt. Some things can backfire. Yeah. Don't put your personal information up there, right? All that kind of stuff. <laughs> but there um, are really great tools. There are really great tools. Yeah. Oh, I love that. That's that's exciting. I hope you have a fun time. <laughs> <laughs> It'll it won't be snowy and yeah. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Well, I think that um, that's all of our questions at this time. Um, I don't see anything else in the Q&A, um, but thank you so much, Ms. Vince, for your time and for your presentation and everything that you shared with us. Mm -hmm. And um, everyone at this time, we will dismiss. And just a reminder, IES 2023 will continue tomorrow at 9 a.m. Eastern with a virtual tour of the St. Patrick's Day Parade in Dublin. That'll be fun. <laughs> More details in the full Friday schedule can be found on our conference website. And of course, while accessing the conference website, don't forget to swing by our virtual exhibit hall to say hello to our Hawks team. And while you're there, you can view a quick five minute demonstration, request your t-shirt and be entered to win a $50 hourly giveaway. And in the spirit of St. Patrick's Day, you'll find a few golden coins throughout the conference website. So make sure to click on those coins to be entered into a additional raffle and we'll see you at the next session thanks again for joining us for day one of IES 2023 and we can't wait to see everyone tomorrow thanks bye-bye